On behalf of the Rockefeller Center, welcome to our first public program of the spring term. For those of you joining from the Upper Valley, we especially appreciate you joining us on such a nice day. We're excited to host Professor uh, Nicholas Christakis from Yale University, who will be discussing the impact of the coronavirus. We want to thank tonight's co-sponsors, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and the Political Economy Project. Before we get started, here's a couple of Zoom housekeeping details. Please ask your questions at any time using the Q&A button, and I'm so pleased to see some of you have, are way ahead of me. Um, to access Zoom's closed captioning feature, navigate to the live transcript button and select show subtitle. And if you don't see that option, look under the more button. When you leave the webinar today, you will see a survey it's a big help to us if you can take the time to answer. It's a just a three question survey. Thank you for doing that. I would like to introduce my colleague, Blake McGill, who's a program assistant at the Rockefeller Center and a junior at Dartmouth College. Hi, Blake. <laughs> um, Blake will be relaying your questions to P Professor Christakis. So ask a lot so that she has a lot to do. And submitting your questions at early increases the chances that they will get answered. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, the director of the Rockefeller Center and a professor of government at Dartmouth College, Professor Jason Barabas. Welcome and thank you to all. Thank you, Joanne. Um, it's a delight to be here tonight. Um, welcome to another edition of the Rocky Watch segment, this time on an issue that has consumed so much attention over the last year, the novel coronavirus pandemic. As of April 2020, there have been more than 133 million cases worldwide and at least 2.8 million deaths. In the United States alone, those numbers are 31 million and more than half a million deaths, which means America accounts for a disproportionately high number of the cases and deaths relative to our population. Cases are rising, but vaccines have been developed and many states are opening up elig eligibility to most of their citizens. This is promising news also with respect to teens and, and, and younger Americans who are, are going to be in line for vaccines as well. And more, and more importantly, 75 million people have recovered from the coronavirus pandemic. So our speaker today is Dr. Nicholas Christakis, and he's the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Sciences at Yale University. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as public health and medical degrees from the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. His work is highly interdisciplinary, spanning the fields of network science, biological science, behavior, genetics. At Yale, he directs the Human Nature Lab, and he's also the co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science. Um, he was elected to several prestigious medical and academic honor societies, such as the National Academy of Medicine, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I should also say that Nicholas Christakis was my boss at one point. He co-directed the Robert Wood Johnson Scholars in Health Policy Research Program at Harvard University in the mid-2000s. Um, he's directed a number of other Robert Wood Johnson Foundation programs at the University of Chicago, and he was a clinical scholar at the Foundation's program at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, his curriculum vitae is more than three dozen pages, three dozen pages long, so there's no way I can do justice to all the books and articles he has written, but it would fill many lifetimes to put it, put it bluntly. Dartmouth has connections as well. So he, he literally, he, his book Connected uh, was, was the required reading for all first year students a couple of years ago. And his is another book titled Blueprint, The Evolution and Origins of the Good Society that is going to be the subject uh, for a session later tonight with some other Dartmouth students. So talking to us over the next hour or so is going to be the book he published just last year called Apollo's Arrow. It's about the coronavirus, but it's also about pandemics across the centuries. We think a lot of this is new, such as the novel coronavirus title, but so much is not. And there's so many public policy lessons and tragedies in, 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 in what we've, we've seen as well. So we'd like to Again, thank our co-sponsors at the Political Economy Project, as well as the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicholas Christakis. We will hear from him and then open it up for questions. And please, again, submit your questions in the Q&A session. Nicholas, please take it away. Jason, thanks so much for, for having me. I was hardly your boss. I was just the director of the postdoctoral program. And uh, it was a great pleasure at that phase of my life. Uh, so I, I'm just going to talk um, for you know, 20, 25 minutes to put some ideas on the table about the pandemic. And then I'll try to answer as many of your questions as I can. 
we all of us happen to be alive at a very unusual moment in the history of our species. Namely, we're alive at a moment when a new pathogen has been introduced into our midst. And this pathogen will circulate among us forever. In fact, this pathogen is having what is known in evolutionary biology as an ecological release. An ecological release is like when you take an invasive species to an isolated island on, in the Pacific and that species overruns the place. We, our bodies are that island to this invasive species, which is the virus. We have no natural immunity to this virus and it's just gonna spread and spread and spread uh, in the human population till it reaches some kind of equilibrium. And by now, and, and in fact, we happen to be alive therefore at an event that's, that occurs about once every century or so. There are from much more commonly, there are um, uh, respiratory pandemics uh, and much more commonly there are occasional outbreaks from animals, but it's rare that we get a global pandemic of this severity. And so we just happen to be alive at a moment when this sort of once in a half century, once in a century event is taking place. And we know at this point quite a bit about the pathogen. Um, for example, we know how deadly is the pathogen. It's intrinsic lethality. This pathogen kills between 0.5 and 0.8% of the people that it infects. If you get symptoms from the pathogen, you get symptomatic COVID, it's about double that. So symptomatic cases of COVID have a between a one and a 1.6% chance of dying. That's actually quite a serious pathogen. If you were an infectious disease doctor, you'd be worried about a pathogen like that. Um, even though it's much less deadly you know, than smallpox or bubonic plague, nevertheless, it's not trivial. And it kills about, um, about uh, 10 times as many people as the flu. It's 10 times as lethal as a typical you know, seasonal flu. And by now, as everyone on this, um, in this meeting knows, uh, the risk of death of this pathogen varies by age. So if you're younger than 25 and you get symptomatic COVID, you have a one in 5,000 or one in 10,000 chance of dying. If you're in your 50s or 60s, you have a maybe one in 100 chance of dying. And if you're in your 70s or 80s, a maybe one in five chance of dying. So there's a steep mortality gradient. But I think it's very important. And, and, I, and I have to say, I'm greatly relieved as a father of children that I don't have to worry so much about my children should they become sick, that they would die. But it's very important as well to realize that mortality is not a problem of the young at any time. In other words, this if you're young and you're hearing this, you should still be worried about this pathogen. Because in fact, this pathogen increases, you know, your chance of dying in the next year is, is you know, one out of 5,000 or something. It's very unlikely. But if you get this disease, that goes up by about 30%, whatever your baseline risk is. So at any age, getting this germ increases your risk of death. That's how deadly it is. We also know <clears throat> at this point how infectious it is. This is quantified by something known as the R0, the R sub zero, the basic reproduction number. That's an intrinsic property of the pathogen. How infectious is it? How easily does it spread? So how many new cases does each case give rise to in a non-immune, naturally interacting host population? And that number is about three. It's between 2.5 and 3.5, which is quite infectious. The most infectious disease known as measles. For measles, the R0 is 16 or 18. Measles just goes like gangbusters. And for seasonal flu, it's about 1.5. Seasonal flu is barely able to um, you know, replace itself. A case of flu makes one and a half new cases. Now, if you take just those two numbers that I gave you and you plot them, uh, uh, so on the x-axis, you put the lethality and on the y-axis, you put the infectiousness and you plot all the respiratory pandemics for the last hundred years, let's say, and this is a standard exercise that many epidemiologists, myself included, were doing a year and a half ago as the data about these uh, metrics were coming out of China. If you plot these up here in the upper right, you have the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was the most serious respiratory pandemic we've had in the last hundred years. Down here in the bottom, you have the 2009 uh, influenza pandemic. Everyone here was alive for that, but nobody probably remembers it because it just gave you the sniffles. It came and it went and didn't cause much problem. In the middle, you have the 1957 influenza pandemic, which was previously the second most deadly pandemic we've had in the United States, respiratory pandemic. Um, and that killed about 110,000 people back in 1957, which would be 220,000 people today. So COVID-19 is the second worst respiratory pandemic we've had in the last 100 years. It's a serious, serious uh, problem. 
Furthermore, the economic devastation of this pathogen is substantial, and I'll return to that as well. So it's not just the health damage. The, the, the epidemic is having many effects on our society. From where I sit, um, we are not at the beginning of the end of this pandemic, but rather at the end of the beginning. You know, we are sort of nearing the end of the opening act of this pandemic when the virus is let loose in our species, even despite the fact that we've invented a vaccine, which I'll also return to in just, in just a moment. So this, so while it is the case that the way we have come to live these days, the, you know, the fact that we're doing this on Zoom, for instance, feels very alien and unnatural and strange. And it is those things. What's really important to understand is that plagues are not new to our species. They're just new to us. We think this is crazy that we've had to come to live this way, that we've withdrawn to our homes, you know, that there's fear and grief in the streets, that our fellow citizens are dying. But plagues have afflicted our species for thousands of years. They're in the Bible. They're in Homer. They're in Cervantes. They're in Shakespeare. Many of my Jewish friends last year were saying that they've been doing Passover seders their whole life, but last year it had a different meaning to them as they spoke about the plague. So the, 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 this experience that we're having right now, which, as I said, feels so alien, is actually not. And, but the problem is we forget for the kinds of things that happen outside of living memory, even though there is a lot of accumulated wisdom in religious traditions, among expert epidemiologists, among medical historians, there's a lot of expertise about the recurrent nature of this threat. For the person on the street who hasn't had the experience, it's all out of sight, out of mind, and they've forgotten. And that's why in large measure, so many Americans were so shocked by what has happened. Now, plagues are an intrinsically collective threat. They are uh, a little bit like climate change actually in this regard. And, um, and they require coll a collective response and often state power uh, to deal with. And it's a little bit analogous to like if an army was invading us, you know, you, you could grab your gun and go to the frontier, but you'd be useless against the invading army. Uh, and everyone could grab their gun and go in a kind of helter-skelter way to the frontier, and they'd also be relatively ineffective. People need to be organized and coordinated. There needs to be a kind of coordinated response, a kind of sharing of the burden if we are to effectively confront this particular kind of threat. Many people think that it's what we are doing to respond to the threat that's collapsing our economy. But it's very important to understand that it's the virus itself that's the problem. Uh, Larry Summers, a former treasury secretary and another former colleague of mine, David Cutler, a health economist, published a paper over the summer in which they quantified the economic disaster caused by this virus. And the title of that paper was the $16 trillion virus. They estimate that from this moment, the virus was loose on our shores and we had community spread and it was gonna do what it was gonna do, have that ecological release, that the virus would cause $8 trillion in economic damage and $8 trillion in death, disability, illness, and so on. This is a catastrophe. Uh, that's like if you went to every American household of four and took away $200,000 of wealth from them. And I, I don't think people have fully understood yet the full nature of what this virus is yet to do to us. It's gonna keep killing us. When I wrote the book, uh, I forecast that the virus would kill between half a million and a million people. We've already crossed the lower threshold. And I think we will be more than the midpoint before the virus is over, before the epidemic is fully over in a few years. And the economic damage is devastating. But I think it's very important to understand the difference. Many people confuse this economic collapse. Uh, they think it's something we've done to ourselves, but that's not true. The economic collapse is something the virus does to ourselves. And this has been observed for hundreds of years. For example, during the plague of Justinian, John of Ephesus, a priest and a historian, uh, wrote this describing what was happening. And in all ways, everything was brought to naught, was destroyed and turned into sorrow, and buying and selling ceased, and the shops with all their worldly riches beyond description, and moneylenders' large shops, he means the banks, closed. The entire city then came to a standstill as if it had perished. Thus, everything ceased and stopped. There was no government actor that was ordering schools and businesses to close back then. 
This type of cessation of social interactions, which of course are crucial for economic interactions, is a product of the natural human response to a deadly germ when it is afoot. And we've had to respond to the virus in a kind of an ironic way. Ancient threats call for ancient measures. Uh, we've, we've used very primitive tools, actually, these so-called social distancing and so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, we also have invented vaccines. I'll come back to that in a moment, which is amazing. But primarily, we've had to do things that our ancestors did, you know, withdraw from circulation, try to in increase hygiene, uh, uh, you know, uh, wear masks, which has been debated in this country for over 100 years, and so on. And one of the ways you can think about what we had to do, the very effective way, is what is known as the Swiss cheese model. So you need to think of every layer of defense, school closure, border closure, testing, quarantining, masking, hygiene measures, and so on. Each of those is a layer of defense, which is very good, but imperfect. It's like a layer of Swiss cheese with holes in it. And the point is, is a single layer is not enough to stop the virus from getting through, because if the virus happens to line up with a hole, it'll get through that layer. But you should have the intuition that if you use, let's say, three or four pieces of Swiss cheese with their holes randomly spaced, and each layer has a different number of holes, a different size of holes, a different location of the holes, if you stack three or four layers of Swiss cheese, you'll form an impervious barrier to the virus. And this is why, incidentally, even though we are getting vaccinated, which is terrific, we still are going to need to implement some non-pharmaceutical interventions going forward, at least for a while, because the, the, the vaccine, excellent though it is, is not 100% effective. It's 95% effective. So there's still some holes in that layer. That's why if you're vaccinated and you go shopping, you should probably still wear a mask. Of course, you can, and you know, you could be outdoors. I'm not saying being vaccinated doesn't confer any advantages. It confers many advantages. But as a society, we're not yet quite out of the woods. Um, there are some other psychosocial features that are very important to understand that uh, are parts of a plague. Because fear, lies, and denial are typical companions of plagues. If you think of plague as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, mendacity is its squire. The germ is spreading through social networks across our connections from person to person, and right behind it fall, follow lies. And that has happened for hundreds of years and is happening now. Misinformation of all kinds is spreading through our community, making it difficult for us to effectively confront the epidemic of germs. So we have sort of dueling contagions. Actually, this is a project that I worked on with, uh, with Feng Fu, who is, a, is a, a, a professor, an associate professor, I think, of mathematics at Dartmouth, was a former postdoc of mine. We published a paper on this a long time ago about the kind of the, 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 the simultaneously spreading biological and social contagions on the graph. And the question is, what's going to win? Is the germ going to outstrip the vaccines? Or is the germ going to outstrip mask wearing? Or is the germ going to outstrip misinformation about the germ, which degrades our ability to confront it? So denial and lies trail germs wherever they spread. And they've done so for a very long time. There was nothing new about our politicians saying, oh, no, nothing is happening. Uh, uh, leaders have been doing this for thousands of years. There was nothing new about people saying, oh no, inject yourself with bleach. You know, uh, People have had these crazy ideas about what to do to, um, to confront epidemics for an incredibly long time. Um, so, um, so another th feature, so fear, lies, denial. Another feature of plagues is grief because plagues are a time of loss. They take our lives, they take our livelihoods, and they take our way of life. Everyone is experiencing grief right now. Some people have lost loved ones, half a million American deaths, probably 10 times as many 5 million Americans know someone intimately who's died, and probably 50 million Americans know of someone who has died, about 100 to, to 1, let's say. So people have grief from loss. People have lost their jobs. Let's not forget how many Americans have lost work. All the young people listening to this call, you know, you've lost, you're not having a normal dating life in your early 20s. You're not able to like go to school in the normal way. You know, being 18 to 22 is a crucial developmental moment in your life. And it's being modified in very particular ways by the plague. So grief is a typical uh, a feature of plagues. And also plagues, interestingly, are a time of meaning. Now, typically during plagues, uh, religion rises, 
and you get rising religiosity. That's happening now. Gallup surveys show this. Uh, and, um, and, but there are other ways in which the search for meaning is manifest during times of plague. And we're seeing that now, for example, in the booming applications to medical and nursing schools, people see uh, a lot of meaning in that type of work or the kind of meaning that essential workers, one or, one or two million Americans are employed in trucking. And those human beings saw different meaning and worth in the work that they were performing during the plague. Uh, and we also, I think, saw it play a role in some of the political protests that we have seen over the last year. So during the summer after the brutal murder of George Floyd, people said, look, this was a, the straw that broke the camel's back with respect to racialized police violence in our society. And there's no doubt that there's a significant long history of racialized police violence. But why this one? Um, yes, it was particularly brutal and awful, and it was caught on video. Well, some people said another factor that played a role in it is that people were uh, unemployed, that unemployment rates were very high over the summer because of the pandemic. And yes, I'm sure that played a role. And other people said, oh, it had to do with the fact that people were cooped up and um, you know, they had nothing else to do and they wanted to get out and protest. And I'm, I'm sure that played a role too. But I also think it was a search for meaning. People were thinking about what's important to me in my life during this time of stress? What kind of society do I want to live in? And this also, I think, motivated the protests. Incidentally, I think similar factors were at play during the January 6th insurrection at the United States Capitol. One of the things that struck me about that, um, that event is the extent to which the people that went in were unmasked. I don't mean masked for coronavirus. I mean, they weren't trying to conceal their identities. They were proud of what they were doing, right? For them, this was a, they saw what they were doing as a kind of patriotism. So over the summer, the BLM protests were seen by the actors as a pursuit of justice. And in January, what the, the actors sort of thought that they were in a pursuit of patriotism. So I think this search for meaning also played a role in these protests. Now, it's very important to understand um, that the lethality of the pathogen that I mentioned at the beginning is an intrinsic property of the pathogen. And we're just lucky that it's not deadlier. I mean, this virus could have been so much deadlier. It could have been like in the movie Contagion, where the uh, infection fatality rate is about 0.3. In the movie Contagion, about 30% of the people who get the virus die. It, this virus could have been that deadly. There are other coronaviruses that are that deadly. Just imagine what that would mean. We would have had like a bubonic plague type catastrophe in the 21st century. And unlike bubonic plague or cholera, uh, which are caused by bacteria, for which we have many effective antibiotics against bacteria, we have very few, if any, effective drugs for, for viruses. So a virus with a lethality of 30%, like smallpox had, for example, would have been ruinous to the world. You know, we would have been facing a kind of um, Armageddon kind of situation. And there's no intrinsic reason we are not. And this is why so many people have been uh, considering the threat of serious pandemics as a national security problem that requires a tremendous amount of effort as the richest nation on earth, as you know, you know, uh, sort of spearheading the Pax Americana, we have a stake in trying to cope better with pandemics, which incidentally I think will be a recurrent threat going forward. There's some evidence to suggest that these pandemics are coming more frequently, although it's very difficult, you know, if it came more free, if it, it was coming every 50 to 100 years, and now it's coming every 20 to 40 years, we wouldn't really detect it so soon. It'd be difficult to know for sure. It's stochastic. So what's gonna happen now? Um, well, uh, uh, let me just do a short digression for epidemiology and then I'll lay out the likely course of the pandemic and then I'll stop and, and we can um, have a conversation. The, the digression has to do with this notion of herd immunity. M many people have heard about herd immunity now Herd immunity is the idea that a population of individuals can be immune from an epidemic, even if not every individual within that population is immune. For example, if you vaccinate 96% of the population against measles, and one of the unvaccinated 4% gets the measles, you don't get an epidemic because there's no one for them to spread it to. They're surrounded by immune individuals. Remember earlier I said that uh, measles is the most infectious disease known. It's r not is 16 to 18. And it turns out that, or you should have the intuition that the more spreadable the disease is, the more infectious it is, the higher the R-naught, the, uh, 
the, uh, the higher the herd immunity threshold, the higher the percentage. In fact, there's a formula you can use to compute it, which is R naught minus one divided by R naught. So earlier I told you that the R naught for SARS-CoV-2 is three. Three minus one divided by three is two thirds, which is 67%. And then it turns out that there's some network science reasons having to do with the fact that not everyone has the same number of friends that actually brings that herd immunity threshold down. It's actually not 67%, it's probably closer to 50%. 50% of Americans need to get this infection naturally, let's say, before we finally reach herd immunity. So what's gonna happen now? Well, miraculously, we've invented a, vac a vaccine. We are basically the first generation of human beings alive to confront this ancient threat who has been able in real time to invent a specific and effective countermeasure that actually might change the course of the epidemic and roll it out in, in such a fashion. Uh, during medieval times, they thought they could do things, you know, like there were these recipes where you like take snakes and mince the snake up and take onions and mince the onion and make a paste of minced snake and onion and smear it on your body and this would ward off the plague. Of course it didn't, but we are able to do something, namely invent a vaccine, which we've done, which is amazing. But we still must uh, manufacture hundreds of millions of doses, distribute those doses, administer those doses, and persuade Americans to take those doses. And then we need to vaccinate the whole world. We need to do that not only for moral reasons, but also for economic reasons in the sense that you know, we need trading partners. We have an interest in the rest of the world not being under pandemic conditions. And we need to do it for epidemiological reasons because unvaccinated parts of the world are petri dishes for the emergence of new worrisome strains of the virus, which strains will inevitably come to our shores. So all of that vaccination is gonna take time. Meanwhile, the virus is still spreading. As Jason mentioned at the beginning, 20 to 25% of Americans have been already infected and acquired immunity naturally, and the virus is still spreading. So from my perspective, at least until the end of 2021, we're gonna be living in a changed world until such time as we reach herd immunity, either artificially because of the vaccine or naturally because of natural uh, infections. Now keep in mind when we reach herd immunity, it doesn't mean that, uh, that the uh, virus is eradicated. The virus is still circulating, still kills people. It's just that its epidemic force will have ended at that point. So, um, so that will mark finally the end of the opening act, the initial period of the pandemic the first two years until the end of 2021. Uh, and then we will enter the intermediate period. We will put behind us the biological and epidemiological shock of the virus. But now like a tsunami that's washed up on shore and, and wreaked huge damage everywhere uh, and the way the water recedes, but now we've got to clean up the mess. And we're going to have to clean up the social, psychological, economic and clinical debris left by this virus. Clinically, I don't think people fully appreciate yet that we don't know for a fact, but perhaps five times as many people as die of the pathogen will be disabled by it. I'm not talking about long or short COVID. I'm saying you recover from the virus, but your body is marked. You have some kidney problems or some pulmonary problems or some neurologic problems, for example. And that means between 2.5 and 5 million Americans will need ongoing medical care as a result of this pandemic. That is a huge uh, burden and duty uh, for our society. Millions of children will have missed school. Millions of people will have lost their jobs. Millions of businesses will have gone out of business. Uh, all of these things will take time uh, to deal with. And I think this will take, a, if you look at the history of plagues, it'll take a couple of years before we finally reach the end of the intermediate period and, uh, and then enter the post-pandemic period, you know, approximately in 2024. And I think that, post-pandemic period is gonna be a little bit like the roaring 20s of the 21st century, like the roaring 20s of the 20th century after the 1918 uh, pandemic. Um, I think religiosity, which had previously gone up, will decline. Uh, I think people who'd been cooped up for so long, had constrained social lives, uh, will relentlessly seek out social opportunities now in nightclubs and restaurants and bars and sporting events and political rallies and musical concerts. Uh, we might see some sexual licentiousness, a kind of loosening of sexual mores, I, I gave this example, just like I just said to you, uh, you know, a little while ago to a, a, 
I did an interview with the Guardian newspaper, and then the New York Post picked it up and gave it the New York Post headline treatment. They said, you know, Yale professor predicts orgy. You know, it's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, that uh, people have been cooped up. So there's going to be a kind of desire for all kinds of social interactions. And my sister Katrina says that I should also hasten to remind people that when I speak of this, what I this applies only to uh, unmarried couples. Anyway, uh, uh, in addition to the kind of loosening of social interactions and, this, and the relentless seeking of social interactions that will take place then, I also think there's gonna be an economic boom because during times of plague, people save their money. And we're seeing that now in the United States. There's nothing surprising about this. Uh, they save their money because they're worried about my, what might happen to them or uh, because there's nowhere to spend money, the economy's collapsed, or, or maybe they don't have a job, so they don't have any money. But then finally, when the plague is behind us, people will spend relentlessly. So I think there'll be an economic boom. I think we will see an efflorescence of the arts. I think we'll see a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and a variety of other long lasting changes um, to our society. Now the variants of concern could put a spanner in the works. Uh, there are, as, as Jason mentioned, uh, some variants, new variants of the virus that are circulating that are more infectious or more deadly. Both of those concern me, but I'd be especially concerned if we got variants that evaded vaccine-induced immunity. So far, we haven't seen substantial evidence of that, which is extremely reassuring, but there's no guarantees about that. And as the r naught goes up, the r naught of the B117 variant is about four instead of three. So four minus one divided by four is 75%. It pushes up the herd immunity threshold. And we have many millions of Americans who will serve as a reservoir for the coming uh, months or years. 75 million Americans under 18, they won't be vaccinated for some time. Uh, maybe 30% of Americans have vaccine hesitancy, don't wanna be vaccinated. Some people who were vaccinated um, will still get infected because the vaccine's not perfect. You add up all those millions of people, that's a big reservoir in our country through which the virus can still wreak havoc. Now in the book, I talk a little bit about, and this is my last comment, I talk a little bit about uh, some of the good things that come during times of plague. And I, I didn't emphasize that in these remarks today, given their brevity, but, um, I, or although I did say a little bit about the necessity of cooperation and how we work together to confront the plague. And one of the most miraculous things we've done is, is our capacity for teaching and learning and cumulative culture has manifested itself in the way the whole world was able to work together and use decades of scientific progress to invent these vaccines, these adenovirus and mRNA vaccines. So that is a kind of wonderful quality of our species that we share knowledge across time and place that we can then use in times of hardship. This capacity for teaching and learning, this capacity for culture, which incidentally is the focus of another book of mine called Blueprint, which Jason mentioned, the evolutionary origins of a good society uh, is, is sort of highlighted during the time of plague so what I'd like to close with is a, re a short two sentences uh, that I want to read from Albert Camus' book, The Plague, which features as its protagonist, a Dr. Rieu. And um, Camus sets this in the 1940s in North Africa, but it's based on epidemics of bubonic plague that occurred in the prior century. And uh, the protagonist, Dr. Rieu, says the following, or the book says the following. Dr. Rieu resolved to compile this chronicle so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure. And to state quite simply what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. And this is very much my philosophy of life, um, that, there, that we are an amazing species. And despite our many limitations and problems, there's more to admire in us than to despise. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was tremendous. Um, we've got a lot of questions piling up. I'm going to ask a few and then turn it over to Blake, who will ask the questions from the audience. Although my first one is related to one of the early questions we got on this. So this is an amazing book in the sense that it was published in mid 2020. So just mid part of last year. So much was unknown then, but so much was anticipated and patterns that you just mentioned from Camus on have played out again and again. But is there anything that we know now that differs? In other words, would you have written anything differently? And we also have had questions from the audience about whether is there a pandemic, is there a, a, a sequel coming to this book? Uh, or, you know, do you have any plans along those lines? Well, 
Um, no, I don't think anything that's happened is fully surprising, um, sad for better or worse. So I started writing the book in the middle of March and I was motivated. I had started working on COVID in January with some Chinese co-authors and we did some work on um, using phone data uh, about uh, transits in, Wu in Wuhan. So we have phone data from China that shows people's uh, motion through space and who they're calling. And um, we were able to use these data to understand the spread of the virus early on. And so I was tracking this virus in January of 2020 and I was getting very alarmed and all the people I was talking to were very alarmed, but no one seemed to be alarmed in the public sphere of our country. And, um, and then Italy collapsed in February and still people didn't seem to be alarmed, especially our politicians, especially in the White House, which I think was just an outrageous dereliction of duty. Although we had a bunch of incompetent governors on the left and the right, uh, nevertheless, we, you know, we had really, I think, bad leadership in the White House with respect to this pandemic. And, um, and uh, so I was very alarmed. So I decided, well, what could I do? And I thought, well, like, maybe I could just sort of write a book that would describe, you know, this is what's about to happen to us. You know, this, this has been happening for a very long time. And it's now our time in the crucible. So I sat down in March to write the book. And I wrote the book uh, till July. I had to deliver it to the editor. And it went to production in August and went on sale in October. So it was very fast. Uh, and and uh, the, I think the, in the book, I, I, I anticipated that the vaccines would be available in the first quarter of 2021. They were a little early. We got them in December of 2020, but it didn't change the, the picture very much. So, so no, I don't think much would change. The paperback is being released in October, and I am going to be writing a new afterword for it and, um, you know, updating a few things and describing a few things that, you know, now that we have more hindsight. But we're still in the middle of this. You know, there'll be histories written about this. There'll be countless exegeses. I mean, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's a major event, major historical event. It's, I agree with that. And actually, that leads to the next question I want to ask, which is really about the lessons, the public policy lessons from this ordeal. And so I was talking about this with some colleagues. We, we had a, uh, a scholarly session earlier in the week on pandemic politics, talking about mask burning or you know, resistance to some of the public health edicts in, in different states and whatnot. So I find that in contrast to the last few pages of the book that, that make some optimistic statements about how this will lead to other forms of collective action. And I was hoping that it would provide those lessons, but so many times we're seeing the opposite. So a lot of resistance to these public health interventions, burning masks, you know, rushing to open up or it's possibly in violation of some of the, uh, the health guidelines. So I guess my broader question is, is will COVID-19 help with COVID-39 or any other future pandemic? You know, a lot depends on how quickly it happens. You know, um, like we said, the inter-pandemic interval is stochastic. So, you know, we could have another one of these in five years mm. and it could be 10 times deadlier or it could be a hundred years before we have one. It's very difficult to know. I think, I think we are investing huge sums of money domestically in preparedness. I think the man on the street, the woman on the street will um, take it more seriously if it occurs during their lifetime in the next 10 or 20 years. I think we will have um, the mRNA vaccine technology will be developed hugely such that a leader of the United States could credibly come and say, look, there's a new pandemic. We're gonna have to be super careful for six months like we were 15 years ago, but we'll have a vaccine in six months. So everyone behave, let's work together as a nation. I think if the American people had been called to action, um, I think they would have done it. I think you know we had a very immature response as a nation. And I think as I describe in the book, the virus struck us at a particularly vulnerable moment in the history of our society, where we have uh, economic inequality at a tremendous high, political polarization, which I know you know quite a bit about, Jason, at a tremendous high. Um, this a kind of anti-elitism that partially flows from those two that unfortunately also manifests itself as an anti-expertise, right? Everyone thinks they're, these experts are out to get us, right? And what do the experts know? Which intersects with another stream in our society right now, which is the ascendance of subjectivity. People think that you know, it's their truth. No, it's not your truth. There's one truth, okay? We may all imperfectly see it. When you say that your truth, you're using a locution. This idea that like everyone is an expert is nobody would take that seriously if you were talking about, you know, car repairs or surgery, right? Like if, if you have a problem that needs, you know, if I need a mechanic, I want an expert mechanic. I don't think I know as much as the mechanic about how to fix my car. It's, that would be a kind of arrogance or hubris. But I think that for many other public policies, 
the person on the street feels authorized or empowered to have expertise about this topic. And I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's right, actually. You know, we, we can know. And there's also misunderstanding about science. So people said, oh, well, the scientists are changing their minds. Well, that's what scientists do, actually. It, it's religious figures that don't change their minds, that are showing fealty to a canon, right? The canon doesn't change. But science, as I wish more Americans understood, is this iterative process of attempting to come closer to the truth. And so this would have required public education. We would have had to have our leading scientists go up there and explain to the American people, yeah, here's what I'm telling you today. Here's the reason why I'm telling you this. Here's my degree of confidence in it. And I'll come back in a month and tell you if I still believe it. And then in a month, if you still believe it, you say, I still do, here's why. And if you don't, you say, I changed my mind and here's why. I think that increases credibility. And I don't think, you know, the Americans are very practical people. You know, I don't, I, I think that that type of an approach might have been effective. Now, I understand there are many pockets of people who don't understand science and, and who have all kinds of superstition. I forgot, millions of Americans think the vaccine is that Bill Gates is injecting nano machines into us or something. I mean, real crazy ideas. Um, so I, I get that. But I think the kind of the center, the broad center of our country, I think is capable of doing the right thing. Maybe I'm just an optimist. I don't know. Anyway, I'm meandering. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. And it, earlier you mentioned uh, the tsunami analogy, right? That we're still going to be cleaning up from this. And there's a wonderful part of the book. I urge everybody to read it. Uh, where you're talking about Japan and when tsunamis have hit, and then there's a sign that they say, do not build houses below this level. And they didn't write it for themselves. They wrote it for people yes. in the future. And I guess that's that's really what I'm going after here too. So it's a, it's a tremendous book. There are so many questions piling up. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Blake right now. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jason. Hello, Blake. You just popped up now on my screen. Hi, how are you? Um, so we have a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A feature. Please continue to submit your questions as they come up for you, um, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, but our first question is talking about vaccines, and you obviously talked about how it was really impressive we were able to kind of develop a vaccine in real time. And so this um, attendee is asking, do you have any residual concerns similar to those expressed on page 237 of Apollo's Arrow about the speed of vaccine development? and possible shortcuts that bypass animal trials or small group tests on humans. I have to look at my copy, 200. I know, I opened up my copy as well. <laughs> what is the question again? Do I have any concerns about the speed with which the trials have been done? Is that the general, is that the gist of it? Yeah, development of, of the vaccine, et cetera. Um, yes, I mean, I did have some concerns, but not anymore. Uh, you know, I think we've now, you know, I think we had good sized RCTs that were well conducted. I think the companies were very transparent. I think tens of millions of people have now had uh, the vaccines. Um, I think um, I think there's you know reason to to be um, you know to be confident in these vaccines. Now there's no way to know for sure for um, you know like if in five or 10 years, we'll see that there was some complication from these mRNA or adenovirus vaccines. But we have a ton of biological evidence that suggests that, um, that, that they won't be a problem. So I'm not, I'm not too worried. I mean, I acknowledge that the technology is very new, but everything we know and everything we've seen so far suggests that they're not so worried, not so concerning. Great, so our next question And is by the way, I think we're gonna be using booster shots for these vaccines for quite some time. So, um, you know, I think that uh, it's unclear if it'll be every every year, every five years, but I do think we're going to start seeing boosters, uh, you know, that people will have to take periodically. Awesome. So our next question is, given that COVID will be with us from here on out, are we likely to have seasonal massive outbreaks, perhaps echoing what has been happening this year? I don't think in the long run that's what's going to happen. I think the disease is going to become endemic. I think it's going to become like some of the other coronaviruses that cause the common cold. It's hard to know over what, what time horizon. I think what will happen is people will be exposed to this virus. Eventually, I think and hope more attenuated forms of the virus that aren't so um, serious uh, will circulate. People will be exposed to it as children. They will develop some immunity. Uh, and then they'll be periodically re-exposed and get the sniffles or will be vaccinated. You know, it'll be like influenza. Uh, that we get periodic vaccines. I think that is the likely outcome. So our next question is, 
Um, basically, obviously, we've seen a lot of mutations of the virus coming out, and you spoke a little bit about how those can kind of throw off the trajectory and the course of the, the duration of this pandemic. And so this user is asking if there's any evidence from other virus vaccines that a whole virus vaccine, or at least a vaccine containing several viral antigens, would provide broader immunity to a range of variants. In general, that's what people think. But amazingly, these mRNA and adenovirus vaccines have proven to be super vaccines. Uh, so what the questioner is asking, like if I, if I do a, a live attenuated version of the coronavirus, so I, I, um, I treat the coronavirus so that it elicits an immune response from you, but cannot sicken you. And if I use the whole virus, there are many different proteins in the virus and your immune system would launch attacks against multiple proteins, not just the spike protein, that's the key part of the, vac the current vaccines that we have. So the question is well-founded theoretically, but for a variety of reasons, these vaccines that we have appear to be capable of inducing very high levels of immunity, admittedly against just one epitope, one antigen um, on the virus. So um, the Chinese are, the Sinovac vaccine, I think is a, um, is a whole virus vaccine. And I think it's not as, and it is not as effective as some of the other vaccines that we have. Great. Um, the next attendee wants to know if you can elaborate on what you mean by the past 100 years of debate over masks in this country. Uh, it's hilarious. Like in, in 1918, there were anti-masking leagues. There were huge debates about masking 100 years ago with all the same political, exact same political framing as we have now. The government shouldn't tell me what to do or no, we can tell you to wear a mask because you're imposing risks on others. You know, it's a, it's, you know, I mean, just exactly the same kind of framing. It, in a, it's sort of nothing new under the sun kind of debate. So masking has been debated in the past and there was a huge debate about it a hundred years ago. And by the way, lots of experiments that were done with the cloth mask, you may have seen those big cloth masks in 1918, people would, back then they did, they did experiments where they had people wear these masks and exhale onto little uh, agar plates and try to grow bacteria to test how effective were the masks. I mean, they had all the same scientific concerns that we've had too. Great. Um, the next question is, obviously there's been a lot of conversation about potentially there being a higher propensity for more pandemics than there had been and kind of an accelerated addition of pandemics as we continue to globalize. Um, so this um, user wants to know, why do you think we will have pandemics more frequently than every 100 years? What is driving that change? Well, there was a paper published in the journal Nature, I don't know, 15 years ago that looked at zoonotic diseases, diseases that afflict wild animals that have come to humans and plotting the number of zoonoses per decade for the last 100 years or 50 or 60 years. And they show a rise in this. And this has to do with the increasing contact we have with wild animals due to rising populations, rising migration, and frankly, climate change, which is forcing humans to encroach on the jungles and other habitats of animals and forcing those animals to leave their habitats and come to us. So there are a number of theories as to why we're gonna get more and more zoonotic diseases and, uh, and some suggestive evidence about a rise in, um, in pandemic disease, but it's very difficult to know for sure, right? Because it occurs you know, probabilistically and over long periods of time. So, you know, in 500 years, they'll know, oh yes, you know, the 21st century is when things took a big step up in terms of frequency of pandemics. But now while we're living it, it'll be difficult to be sure. One aspect of pandemics that you spoke about a little bit at length um, is this concept of grieving. And so our next attendee wants to know, obviously some people have been affected by your estimate, maybe 5 million people know um, somebody who has passed away as a consequence of COVID-19. And so they want to know for those who necessarily haven't been affected, like what happens if we enter this period of economic growth and revitalization, um, but we don't have any opportunity to grieve as a community or society. And maybe if there's some kind of historical example for how um, societies have grieved pandemics. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, uh, we're going to have more deaths. So the numbers are going to go up. And, um, you know, I think... I think many tens of millions of Americans will know of someone who died, but that's, as I said, not the only way we are affected. Other millions of Americans will be disabled by it themselves or be connected intimately to someone who's disabled, even if they don't die. 
they will have been affected in other ways. Their children will have missed school. They will have missed economic or educational opportunities. I mean, people are, going, are being harmed by this uh, epidemic. So I think there are different, as I said, different kinds of grieving that are taking place. You know, what effects that has on our society long-term are hard to know for sure. Uh, and what kind of collective memory, you know, will we all want to engage in a post hoc denial, you know, and forget about it and put it behind us. Probably there'll be a lot of deep interest in that too. Uh, but we do that a little bit at our peril because there's, as I said, no reason this couldn't happen again. Absolutely. Um, and our next user is asking what kind of timetable, you've talked about 2024 for potentially the US, um, what kind of timetable for post-pandemic life can we see for developing countries? A lot depends on how rapidly the rich countries in the world vaccinate the rest of the world. And there's also some other irony is that, you know, the average, the median age in Nigeria is 17. The median age in Italy is 47. So one of the reasons Nigeria and other developing countries are not being as hard hit is that they're just younger. I mean, substantially younger. So it is a very patchy epidemic for a host of reasons, including um, these demographic variation from place to place. Nevertheless, the developing world settings, lower and middle income countries will definitely need assistance uh, uh, for vaccination. I also need to say that the kind of overarching pattern that I described, which stretches across a few years, is a little different than um, then sort of over a few months, like I think this coming summer is going to be much nicer, uh, certainly than last summer. I think we have, you know, hundreds of millions of Americans, 100 million or more Americans will be vaccinated. I think it'll be summer weather, people will be outside, which is, you know, much safer. Uh, you know, I think we are going to see a little bit of a party over the summer, which I think will, you know, may harm us actually come the fall, because come fall, we'll get another wave of this uh, epidemic. It won't be anywhere near as bad, I don't think, as the prior wave. But, um, but you know, these respiratory pandemics come in winter waves and we're likely to have another one in the fall or winter. Yep, absolutely. And there are a number of attendees who are curious about maybe your stance on the conversation surrounding vaccine nationalism. Should richer countries kind of be investing in making sure that the, the vaccine is kind of populated globally? Yeah, of course, like I said, we, we have every interest in that, not just a moral argument, but not even, as I said, not just a, an economic argument, because we need trading partners, but also an epidemiological argument. We, we need to vaccinate the whole world so that, you know, dangerous strains of the virus don't emerge in other parts of the world and spread to us. We also need to, to uh, invest some money, billions of dollars in a worldwide monitoring system to, um, which benefits those other countries, but benefits us. Right, the earlier we can detect new worrisome strains of the virus, the sooner we can begin to develop booster shots and manufacture the hundreds of millions of doses that will be necessary. So there's a lot that we and all the nations of the world need to do to work together to address this. It's like climate change or nuclear war. I mean, this is a collective threat and it will require, I think a whole host of, we'll have a whole host of diplomatic sequelae. Great, and um, another attendee wants to know, you spoke of an economic Boom because of the money accumulating with fewer ways to spend it. Obviously, a lot of people have been hurt financially as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they were wondering if this kind of economic boon is going to be able to be spread across varying like economic strata. Yes. I think employment will rise. I think people, yes. I mean, I, I mean, in general terms, pandemics strike unequally, right? I mean, the, the sick, the poor, the elderly, the incarcerated, uh, um, ethnically and racially marginalized groups, diseases typically strike socially marginalized subgroups of people always. And so the burden is felt unequally. And, and, the, and the questioner is right that that's true now. Uh, but I think the boom will also will be spread pretty widely. Yes, I, if you look at some previous uh, boom times. Um, our social networks have been quite strongly influenced by the attitudes of our pre-pandemic friends towards the pandemic, their tolerance for personal health risk, the creation of COVID bubbles. Um, this attendee wants to know how you anticipate kind of these social networks restructuring as a consequence of the pandemic and maybe how they will or will not contribute to increased political polarization, um, cultural polarization, et cetera, et cetera, in the US. I think the kinds of changes we're seeing in our social interactions are temporary. You know, I think in five or 10 years, we'll go back to where we were. I mean, just keep in mind, we've, we've had pandemics before and we didn't, I mean, over evolutionary time, we, our species absolutely has evolved to 
have networks with particular structures that uh, that are responsive to the existence of disease among us. And in fact, this is a discussed a little in Blueprint, uh, the evolutionary origins of a good society, that exact topic. But over like historical time, no, I think we will go back to our previous uh, kind of social um, interactions. The the issue of political polarization, which preceded the pandemic. Um, I don't know if I have a sense of whether the pandemic will make that better or worse, but I am very worried about that as an American citizen. I'm worried at the, you know, the difficulty we have in, in talking to each other and in compromising. Um, you know, I think this, this, uh, this demonizing of people with different political beliefs is just stupid and, and counterproductive. Our enemies love it when we fight. Um, and, you know, we can engage in political disputes, but you know, we should look for compromise and look for middle ground and, you know, try to be a functioning democracy, in my view. Absolutely. Um, another attendee is curious. You obviously talked about how this, this virus impacts older people at a much higher rate. So how do you think our collective reaction to the pandemic would have been different if young children and babies were more well, affected than older people? It would have been much, it would have been much, um, much more alarming, I think, or if the, the virus was just deadly, or if the virus was deadlier, I think we'd have taken it more seriously. The virus was just, just deadly enough to harm us, but not deadly enough to like really galvanize everyone's attention. Plus, I didn't discuss this in the talk, but it's in the book. The virus is capable of protean manifestations. The, the fact that this virus can give, make you asymptomatic, give you the sniffles, make you seriously ill or kill you, the fact that it does so many different things made it possible for many Americans not to take it as seriously because they thought, oh, well, most of the people I know who got it, you know, they just had a bad cold. Well, that's true, but a lot of them died too, you know. And uh, if, if so, this this confusing picture I think has made it difficult for us. And so I think if the virus had been deadlier, or if it had afflicted young people, I think we would have taken it even more seriously. Incidentally, I got really upset with the kind of narrative that oh, it's just the elderly dying. I mean, that's a that's not a civilized response. I mean, yes, I was also relieved that I had less to worry about my own children dying, but the elderly people are our neighbors and our parents and our friends. And, you know, I mean, this idea that, oh, well, it's just people in nursing homes, this is not a civilized or moral or epidemiological sound take on, on the pandemic in my view. Great, and then this is gonna be the last question. So I'm gonna combine two very similar questions. How fast can humans evolve to develop innate resistance to COVID variants? And what I guess you believe the first, like the future of booster shots and how that's gonna be distributed. Yeah, we can't, we can't evolve our way out of this. Human evolution takes, you know, centuries. So that's not the way out for us. Although, you know, we, we have evolved under pressure of, uh, and I discuss this in the book, uh, of certain other pathogens. Um, and uh, we will need booster shots, I suspect. It's not clear yet, but I think we will be having booster shots either every year, like the flu, or every five years, like tetanus, something like that, I think, is in our future. Great. So that's going to end the Q&A portion. And as we wrap up um, the speech, again, thank you so much, Professor Christakis, for coming to speak with us. Um, if you just want to offer any final thoughts you have, and then Joanne will close us out. No, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing another event with some Dartmouth students in a couple of hours. And I look forward to that. And I live in Norwich, Vermont, not far away. So I, I uh, often am on your campus and greatly enjoy it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Christ Christakis, Professor Barabas and Blake. Uh, that was a lot to digest. And I really want to thank you for ending with the Camus quote to give us that little smidge of, of uh, hope. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And I would like to invite everyone to come back next week on Wednesday at five o'clock when we will be hosting um, Oren Cass, who's the executive director of American Compass and he will be speaking on the future of conservatism. Thank you all for attending and thanks for the second event tonight, Dr. Christakis. Thank you all. See you next week. <laughs>